Hello and welcome. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Dr Sharon Skimbury and I'm here today to talk about international business. We're working from Charles Hill's text on international business and today we're covering chapter two. So chapter two is all about the national differences in the political, economic and legal systems of um, a nation state. So uh, there we go. Right. So here are the learning objectives. Uh, here are the learning objectives for the chapter. We're going to understand how the political systems of countries differ and similarly so for economic systems and legal systems. And then at the at the back end of the chapter, we're going to relate that to managerial practice. OK. Now, one of the third, first things we need to recognise is that when we're considering political, economic and legal systems of a particular country, a particular country that we want to do business in, we need to recognise that these systems are interdependent and they influence each other. So let's start with political systems. Political systems um, is about the system of government, the form and structure of government in that nation. And according to Hill, we need to assess um, the political system of a particular country on two dimensions. One is collectivism or individualism orientation and the degree to which they are democratic or totalitarianism. OK, so let's look at each of those in turn. Collectivism is about putting the needs of the society as a whole as the priority the needs of the society as a whole is considered more important than individual freedoms. In contrast to collectivism, individualism is about um, the individual having freedoms in economic and political pursuits. So um, in an individualist society, the interests of the individual takes precedence over the interests of the state. So America, is an individualism, uh, individualist society, and this is evident in the political system, because in America there is a guarantee of individual freedom and self-expression, the First Amendment. There's also um, the consideration that the welfare of the society, America as a whole, is best served by letting individual people pursue their own economic self-interest. So this is in contrast to a collectivist society. So we have collectivism and individualism as extremes, but we won't, don't want to say collectivism versus individualism because there's variations in between. And socialism is one of those variations. So socialism, a socialist society can be recognised when there is public ownership of the means of production for the common good. So things like um, utilities, for example. Um, uh, Karl Marx is uh, known for his philosophy that the few benefit at the expense of the many in a capitalist society where individual freedoms are not restricted. So while um, uh, some people mistakenly assume that Karl Marx is associated with communi communism. That's not the case. It's more socialism that he argues. And um, uh, like I said earlier, we don't want to put um, collectivism versus individualism and similarly so with communism um, versus democracy. Uh, um, the the reason I say that is because communism is um, many times achieved through violent revolution and uh, that's not good. <laughs> so there are social democrats who argue that socialism is a good idea and it's achieved through democratic means. And part of how it's achieved is through the privatisation of publicly owned utilities, for example. Okay, so um, communism 
uh, is, is one extreme and democracy is another extreme. On this slide, it's um, democracy is one extreme and totalitarianism as another extreme. So there's variations in between, but let's look at the two extremes just so that we simplify uh, and, and get a basic understanding. So democracy is all about government driven by the people and uh, the government is commanded by the people either directly or through um, elected representatives, as is the case in America. Uh, in contrast to a democratic society, totalitarianism is about one person or one particular party who holds absolute control and opposes political parties, right? So nobody's able to challenge them. And this is what we see going on in Russia at the moment. So uh, Alexei Navalny challenged President Putin in Russia and um, consequently was poisoned. <laughs> he spent uh, a spell in hospital uh, outside of Russia and, um, and then he went back to Russia. And as soon as he went back to Russia, they arrested him and jailed him. So there's people on the streets protesting this in negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's quite a serious situation and not pretty. So um, Hill suggests that democracy and individualism go hand in hand, as does the communist version of collectivism and totalitarianism. But I'm, I'm here to remind you that uh, there's actually variations in between these extremes of democracy and totalitarianism. And this is what we see going on in Hong Kong at the moment. So Hong Kong was a British colony up until 1997. Actually, um, Britain leased Hong Kong for like 100 years or something. And uh, that lease expired in 1997. So in 1997, China moved back in, right? <laughs> and um, and so it's been, it's been problematic since that time. But in 2019, uh, particularly, we saw violent protests on the streets of Hong Kong. Now what's going on in early 2021 is that Britain is offering Hong Kong citizens a path to British citizenship and we've got this mass exodus going on. Okay, so we can talk about um, the extremes of democracy and totalitarianism. So let's revisit uh, about what is a democratic political system. Um, democracy is about when the citizens uh, periodically elect individuals to represent them. And democracy also includes a multitude of safeguards uh, based in constitutional law. Um, these include freedom of expression, the First Amendment in America, freedom of the media to report on whatever is going on in the society, universal adult suffrage, and this has to do with the right to vote regardless of race or gender, for example. And it's all about a fair court system, an unbiased court system. So this is democracy now. So in contrast to a democratic political system, we can recognize totalitarianism in various forms. So communist totalitarianism is achieved with dictatorship. Theocratic totalitarianism is when a religious tribal totalitarianism totalitarianism is about when a party, a group or even one individual represents the interests of a particular tribe that monopolizes political power. Um, another form of totalitarianism is right wing totalitarianism, where um, this form of totalitarianism generally permits individual economic freedom, but it restricts individual political freedom, including free speech, on the grounds that it would lead to the rise of communism. Now, 
maybe you recognize some elements of what's going on in um, various nation states at the moment. <laughs> okay, so just like we have different versions of totalitarianism, we also have different versions of democracies. And um, so pseudo-democracies lie somewhere between what is pure democracy and what is complete totalitarianism. So of course, pseudo-democracies comprise some authoritarian elements um, and these elements uh, 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 capture some of the mechanisms of the nation state and use these mechanisms to deny political and civil liberties. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about economic systems now. So a market economy is one form of economic system. And in a market economy, all productive activities are privately owned. Production is determined by supply and demand and supply is not restricted. Um, the role of government is to encourage free and fair trade within a market economy. A different type of economic system is a command economy. And in this type of economic system, the government plans the goods and the services, the quantity and the price, and then allocates them for the good of society. So businesses in a command economy are owned by the nation state. Historically, communist countries operate under a command economy. So in a command economy, there's no economic incentive for individuals to be innovative in terms of serving um, the community uh, for a profit, for example. Now, of course, um, a market economy is one extreme, a command economy is another extreme. In the middle, we have variations, which Hill refers to as a mixed economy. In a mixed economy, there are some sectors that are privately owned and some that are government owned. Um, uh, once common in the developed world, um, a mixed economy is currently less common. Uh, in a mixed economy, the government may give assistance to businesses that are struggling or whose operations are vital to national security, for example. So in recent times, the American government has bailed out um, the automobile industry, um, has bailed out uh, the banking industry in the 2008 recession. Currently, in the coronavirus-induced uh, economic recession, um, that is being experienced throughout the world, including the US, the CARES Act was implemented in 2020. And currently the Biden administration has another um, uh, support um, bill under negotiation. So when we're talking about the legal systems of a country, we're talking about the rules or the laws that regulate behaviour within that country. We're also talking about the process through which those laws are enforced, as well as how any grievances are addressed. So the legal systems of a particular country are influenced by the political system within that nation state. Now, there are different legal systems there is common law, and this is based on tradition, based driven by precedent and custom. It's more flexible than other legal systems, but it's not the only legal system. There is also civil law. So civil law is based on the detailed laws organized into codes. And this, is, this system is less adversarial than a common law system. Then there's theocratic law and this is based on religious teachings most common is islamic law now there's differences in contract 
law. So a contract is the specific, uh, uh, the contract specifies the conditions under which an exchange occurs and the detailed, and, and the contract details the rights of the parties involved with that contract. So contract law is a body of law that governs contract enforcement. So there's differences in contract law when we look at these variations of legal systems. Under common law, contracts are very detailed with all the contingencies spelled out. <laughs> so it's complex, it's highly technical language. Um, and so contracts under common law can quite often be more expensive and can be adversarial. Under civil law, contracts tend to be much shorter and less specific. So the United Nations has a convention on international sale of goods. Um, uh, they, they, the United Nations convention um, says this is what needs to be um, comprising any contract for the international sale of goods. And I've given you a link there so that you can see which nations signed on when for this UN convention on the contracts for the international sale of goods. So this UN convention establishes a uniform set of rules that governs um, certain aspects of when contracts are, can be made and how they are performed between the buyers and sellers on the international marketplace. It applies automatically to all contracts for the sale of goods between different organisations based in countries that have signed on to this convention. Unless, of course, the parties have opted out. OK, so. Um, Property rights and cor corruption is another consideration in the legal systems uh, of a particular nation state. So when we're talking about property, we're talking about a resource that an individual or an organisation owns. We're talking about land, building, equipment, capital, mineral rights, the organisation itself, as well as intellectual property. Now, property rights are about the legal rights over the use of that resource and how that resource um, is put to work and uh, how that resource generates income. Private action is part of what we need to consider here and uh, that relates specifically to theft, piracy, blackmail by in private individuals or groups. And then there's the consideration of public action and corruption. So in some countries, it's quite the norm for public officials to extort income resources or even property in order to do business in that nation state. So this can be done by um, bribery. It can be done through um, excessive taxation. It can be done through um, requiring licenses that are very hard to get. <laughs> and um, uh, it might involve having to compensate the actors involved, the owners involved. And um, it's highly problematic uh, if an American firm, for example, is going into a foreign country where this is the normal practice with regards to property rights, where corruption is the norm, um, because American organisations venturing uh, outside of America to do business, it doesn't matter which country they're in, they're bound by American law. And bribery in America is illegal. So this is what happened when Walmart ventured into Mexico and um, they wanted a particular location site uh, near Mexico City. Um, there was some issues with that site. The 
uh, indigenous, local indigenous people did not want that site to go to Walmart. Um, but Walmart paid some money to smooth the situation and the officials in charge granted the permit, the construction permit, and so it all went through. Um, uh, interestingly enough, nobody went to jail over that one, so there's a whole story behind, behind that incident. On this slide, we've got um, the corruption by country as of 2018 listed. So um, the higher the score here, the cleaner is the country. So New Zealand being the highest score here in 28 is the country that's recognised as to be free and clear of corruption relative to the other countries. You'll see that Somalia and Venezuela are at the top and the US is just behind um, uh, South Korea and Poland. So not necessarily clear. I've given you a hyperlink there to um, corruption measures for 2020. So there's various uh, international laws that um, people doing international business need to abide by. There's the For Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and this act suggests that it's illegal to bribe a foreign government official to obtain or maintain business over which that foreign official has authority. Uh, this act requires all publicly traded companies to keep detailed records that would reveal whether a violation of the act has occurred. And that one relates specifically to the Walmart case study that I mentioned just earlier. There's also the Convention on combating bribery of foreign public officials in international business transactions came into effect in 1997. It's basically saying that bribery of a foreign public official is a criminal offence. And um, we need to also recognise that uh, uh, intellectual property is something um, that is very relevant to international business and intellectual property refers to uh, the product of intellectual activity such as computer software, um, uh, a screenplay, music, um, uh, a patent. So the patent is about the inventor's exclusive right. intellectual property. copyrights and trademarks are also examples of intellectual property so intellectual property is protected through patents copyrights and trademarks but you have to get the patent the copyright and the trademark in the foreign country that you're entering into so um, there is a world intellectual property organization there is the paris convention for the prop protection of industrial property. So there are some international agreements in place. Product safety regulations and product liability laws. These are very relevant to international business because of, because of course these laws and regulations vary from country to country. Product safety laws are about safety standards to which a product must adhere. These vary from country to country. When you're venturing into an international market, you need to know, uh, is your product gonna pass the safety standards or not? If the answer is no, then maybe it's gonna be too expensive to meet those standards and therefore not viable to enter that foreign market. Same goes for product liability. Product liability involves holding a firm and its officers responsible when a product causes injury, um, death or damage. So, um, so these product liability legislation can actually be much greater if the product does not conform to the safety standards. And of course, criminal and civil laws apply. So we've got all these 
not only legal, but ethical considerations to consider when we venture into foreign markets. At the end of the day, regardless of the political, economic and legal systems of the foreign market that we are entering, we need to recognise that um, it doesn't matter what form these interdependent systems take, um, they have implications for how we manage our organisation in that country and how we manage our trade and investment with that country. So there's two broad implications. Um, uh, there's not only legal considerations, there's ethical considerations. And um, of course, these sy systems, we have to be um, conversant with uh, the systems within the country that we are considering as a potential foreign market um, because we need to know, is it viable? Is it economically attractive to enter that market um, uh, or that investment? A country with a democratic political system, a market-based economic system, and a strong and stable legal system will be more attractive to do business in. So there you go, there's chapter two. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I'll see you again soon.